Hi, thank you very much. Uh, so you forgot your phone. Um, the, uh, I was very privileged to present at Google when Antifragile came out in California. And one, uh, it was six years ago. And one observation I will make is that the average age in this room is six years older than it was six years ago. Okay. So, so I'm going to talk about my book, Skin in the Game. <laughs> And a book is not an idea. And the first thing before we start, I'm going to discuss how I write, okay? how the, the, the whole body of work is organized, and what is the inserto, and why it's in a fractal, organized in a fractal way. My, my idea is that if a book can be summarized, two things. One, it will not survive. And the second thing is it's not worth reading. <laughs> you read a summary. So a book cannot be about an idea. No more than a painting is about uh, something other than being a painting. Uh, so a book has to be a self-standing item that you cannot reduce. And that may communicate some message or not. That's not the relevant point. It can be organized in a way that read it in a fractal way. So the way it's written, you have sentences, paragraphs, sections, chapters, and volumes. And everything has to be integrated as a whole. So, so that was the idea. That's the idea of the inserto, five volumes uh, on uncertainty. And 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 the idea is uh, to write you know, for the author to write on his or her own terms. That's my idea of how an author should write. And I do it myself with uh, passion. All right, I write on my own terms. The first volume was fooled by randomness, and. Um, Fooled by Randomness is an interesting book, but nobody wanted to publish it. Nobody could figure out what it was about. It had probability. It had finance. And then people tell me, what does finance have to do with probability? It had fictional characters, Nero Tulip. And then there's me. And they say, what does a fictional character or a fable have to do with a book? They couldn't figure out what it was about. I tell them, oh, the book is about philosophy. Ah, oh, OK, no, no, why is there any finance in a philosophy book? Or why is there a nonfiction? Uh, fictional characters and philosophy books. So I wrote on my own term. I told them to get lost, and I kept writing on my own term. And in the end, the book survived. So what is my modus operandi while writing the inserto? Now, there is a restaurant <laughs> called, uh, used to be a restaurant called Lindy, that closed on the day this was published. All right, it went bankrupt on the day this was published. It delivered very, very, uh, I would say, I don't know if inedible, uh, conveys the right impression. Um, uh, the, the, the absolutely horrible. It was known for its cheesecake, but you know what happens when you get famous for cheesecake. You sort of cut corners, and it becomes inedible after a while. But tourists kept flocking in for a while until they, you know, so the thing went bust right after my book. And the problem is that the Lindy, there's something named after that restaurant called the Lindy Effect. Now, what is the Lindy effect? It was discovered in that restaurant by actors that plays, because that, uh, the, the restaurant specialized in giving a cheap coffee or almost undrinkable coffee to unemployed actors. So, you know, and then when you're unemployed actor, actors, by the way, are usually unemployed, particularly on Broadway. So they would sit down and talk about <laughs> plays, all right? So, the, uh, they discovered that a play that had been around for 200 days had an extra 200 days of life expectancy. And, and 1,000 days, 1,000 more days. It was discovered at, and uh, it became known as the Lindy effect. And about every single generation of mathematician had tried to model it. And each, the models always work, but, it, you know, but complete different models, all right? And the last iteration is the one I've been working on, <coughs> on Lindy effect. Now, how do I use the Lindy effect? Well, very simple. When I write, when I started Fooled by Randomness, is if you want your book to survive, how do you write? Can someone tell me? How do you make your book survive? What's the trick? If you want people to read your book 10 years or 20 years from now, if you won't have any chance of that happening. Make somebody hate it. That works, but there's got to be something else. What else? <laughs> Sorry? Write mm, That may work. Show that you, it's like the inserto is not 
body parts, but it's one whole. Yes? Use old ideas. Very good. <laughs> Use old ideas. The Badalindi effect in old technology has a huge survival advantage over new technology. OK? Like, uh, I'm not saying that the future will not be technological, but I'm saying that what will be displaced is a newer technology, not the old technology. <laughs> so the way, if you want to write something that can be read 20 years from now, or hope to be read 20 years from now, make sure it could be read by someone 20 years ago. So project yourself backward in time. It's much easier than go forward. Had someone read the book in 1960, 1980, would he or she have, you know, you know, would it have been interested in the message, in, in the treatment? Yes, no. If yes, that's exactly how you do it. So it's basically backwards. People who think that the work, the they have to be technological for the work to survive, it's the exact opposite. By the the effect, simple logic, and effectively, if you want to predict the future, you can't predict. What new will happen? Nobody predicted Google. Okay, your your grandparents didn't think that you guys would be wearing a gym clothes and a you know a, <laughs> like a, with, with a with a dog friendly uh, things delivering sushi for free. Okay, and uh, so and and cappuccino actually a very good cappuccino. I mean, I remember when I first came to New York the, how it tasted. So your grandparents didn't predict that. You cannot predict, but you can predict something. <laughs> which is that what is recent will be replaced by something more recent. So it's easier to predict that what is fragile can break and what is by the Lindy effect. So it has some, for some domains, it doesn't work for all domains. So now that I, okay, spoke about literature, it's good, good enough. So now we can move on, move to uh, skin in the game, okay? Now skin in the game, I have absolutely no idea what skin in the game is about. Because every time I try to explain it, I come up with a different story. <laughs> okay, so it means it has a lot of layers, multi-layer. Okay, uh, the only problem is it doesn't have Fat Tony, my character of previous books, because I killed him at the end of uh, Antifragile, and I, and I couldn't really, I didn't know how to get him back. All right, I had to. I looked at how Sherlock Holmes came back, and it was anachronistic, so I I, I didn't know how to do it. Okay, so. Uh, so I'm uh, sorry, uh, so for this uh, episode of the inserto, Fat Tony will be absent. However, his wisdom will per permeate the book. So if someone asks me, what is Skin and Game about? I'd say it's about how Fat Tony learns things, how he would view the world as compared to some bureaucrat. Simple, okay? So that's one, one approach. Now a little bit of background about how I got, this is by the way the German edition, and they, had, they, they couldn't translate it to German, so they had to translate skin in the game by skin in the game, okay? So that's German for skin in the game. Okay. So the, uh, my national origin is this, okay? I was a, I was a trader, so I didn't become uh, someone mathematically uh, oriented early on in life. First, I had to become a trader. Now, you learn when you're a trader, first of all, you learn that, um, that uh, mathematicians and people who model are full of S star. I don't never spell it out in my books, so let's uh, let's use baloney as a good proxy. But whenever I say baloney, you know what I mean, all right? So that theoretician and academics are full of baloney because we have a view of the formulas we use that is organic, bottom up, and this led to anti-fragile, where I was explaining that. Architects always do a better job when they don't use Euclidean geometry, when they use the rules acquired by architects, not mathematical top-down rules, bottom-up. So, but I discovered probability in a, in a specific way, bottom-up, okay, it was different. And then start getting into the field, coming from the back door. And after, uh, you, know, you know, after you stop trading, I couldn't find anything interesting to do with my life, okay? That was, um, so I decided to do that stuff here, okay? That's my retirement from trading. And of course, uh, you know, with a mission, so I came from practice to theory, and usually people go from theory to practice, particularly in something very technological or something very scientific. But this parallels what I showed in Antifragile that, um, and that we had so, 
so much evidence from history that people had the illusion that technology comes from science, <laughs> okay? When in fact, science comes from technology <laughs> more often, except for well-advertised things, most sciences came from technology. In other words, they started doing something, didn't know exactly why it worked, and then someone claimed credit later on, what I call lecturing birds how to fly. So, so starting working with probabilistic models, and I realized that people who traded have a different view of the world than those who came from theory, which is obvious, as Yogi Berra would say, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, and practice there is, so it's a different mindset. But there's something else I figured out, that those who became practitioners after knowing theory always blew up. Okay, so in other words, practice didn't help you if you came from theory, right? There's something in the mindset of people who studied economics or something that made them blow up, okay? Uh, with the exception of mathematicians because it's sort of theory free. Mathematics is just some kind of list of things that you believe to be true, basically. So, uh, and among these things, there's something I call the ludic fallacy. Now, why am I talking about ludic fallacy? Because I, when I Googled, as you, you guys, uh, it's like, uh, invented the word, I'm using Google, you know, when I search for it on the web, <laughs> okay, the, uh, the, I discovered this very ugly painting by a fellow called Isaac McCaslin, exhibited at a Saatchi gallery called The Ludic Fallacy. I don't see the connection with my work and my word, The Ludic Fallacy, but let me explain The Ludic Fallacy, and I hope it's not as ugly as this. Ludic fallacy is that the probability we, or the risk and uncertainty that we encounter in real life has very little to do with the uh, thing you, you encounter in casinos and games. And ludic is game, from game, coming from games in Latin. That, that's what I call the ludic fallacy. So, uh, so this is sort of like preparing the background for skin in a game. And incidentally, the main idea of the inserto if the incertos, if one asks to, to describe it, I say it's a series of uh, uh, fables, what, uh, what do I call it? Um, an investigation of opacity, luck, uncertainty, probability, la la la, okay? Um, in the form of personal essays with autobiographical sections, stories, parables, philosophical, historical, and scientific discussions. So basically, it's a mishmash of things that are turn out to be readable for some. Okay, or for at least uh, they pay the price, okay. Whether they read it or not, it's not, you know, <laughs> I, I, I got the same. The, the money doesn't change, okay. And, but there's one point about the inserto, pervading the inserto, and I realized too late, you know, to put it in, in the book, that there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. There's a lot more uncertainty than you think there is. But the way <laughs> to deal with such uncertainty is unique. So in other words, there is a lot of certainty about how to act under conditions of uncertainty. You see, um, a very simple uh, example. If you receive from uh, Araka, which is in Syria, and ISIS and ISIS thing, a package, all right, and written on it, you know, it originates in Raqqa, this is a package. What do you do with it? Do you open it? <laughs> no, so you have a lot of certainty what to do with that package, all right? So under, the more uncertainty there is, the more certainty there is of what to do. If you really don't know if the plane is robust, you don't get on it, okay? So the more uncertainty about the plane, the more certainty about not getting on it, okay? So, and this is sort of like what, what, what permeates the inserto, but I couldn't put it in, in concise terms because it takes a while. It takes me 25 years to bring an, an, an idea to its summary, you see? So maybe, you know, if you invite me to give another talk here, in five years I'll be explaining skin in the game. So, the, uh, so now, simple application of skin in the game to make you really realize what's going on with uh, our knowledge of the world without skin in the game. I haven't explained yet skin in the game. Um, this is commonly known as a restaurant, okay? A friend of mine who, like me, was a trader, he was a former partner at Goldman Sachs, an oil trader, so he talks like oil traders, got in a very bad idea to invest in the restaurant business. And if I have one piece of advice, in case I die here, just don't invest in the restaurant business. <laughs> don't open a restaurant, okay? Um, unless you really uh, want to lose your money slowly, all right, or, or sometimes quickly in New York City. So he discovered the following, that uh, 
the restaurant business has a lot of uh, prizes. The best sushi in Lower Manhattan, the best sushi, uh, uh, you know, uh, with music, the best sushi without, whatever. It is. So you have all these categories, okay? And then there is a best restaurant in that category, all right? The best rare steak, the best T-bone, uh, whatever, west of uh, the Hudson. Whatever. You have all these categories. And uh, there are prizes, actually. Now, who decide on these prizes? Journalists and other restaurant owners. There is a gala dinner where they give these prizes. And guess what? Most restaurants who got prizes were closed, <laughs> were shut down, all right? Were shut down, no, you know, out of business, okay? So it tells you the following. Any business where you're judged by your peers and not by some contact with reality is gonna rot <laughs> eventually, all right? And that's why companies go bust, that's what happens. Now, the, this person, I think, is a plumber, right? Are plumbers judged by other plumbers, or they're judged by... Okay, they're judged by other plumbers, no? Uh, no, they're judged by you, your client. Okay, very good. So if you, you know, they may love you, other plumbers, but that's it. So any business that, where you have contact with reality in the form of your client judging you, okay, will has more... <laughs> you know, uh, has fewer expert, pro what I call expert problem, which I outlined in the black swan. An expert being, I used to call an expert an empty suit, until I discovered that a lot of them actually don't wear suits anymore. Well, time have changed, so I have to rename it to something else. That's not Lindy, you know, the, the, uh, so, there are a lot of classes of people. There's a tableau in the black swan. Who's an expert? Weather forecasters, they're experts. Climate, uh, hmm, hmm, we don't know, all right? Uh, accountants, they're experts, okay? If they can add them, subtract, you, you know, you can pretty much have the evidence that they pretty much, and follow the rules of the various accounting rules, so they're experts, no? How about uh, financial economists? Not experts, <laughs> okay? So, so, but, so you have, it, it's very, very simple. No contact with reality, no feedback from reality. So that's skin in the game. That's the epistemology of skin in the game. And you can apply it to a lot of things. People in policy making, they're not experts. Anything macro, it's much easier to micro BS than micro BS. And that's the motto of the book, okay? So when micro BS, you don't see the feedback. You know a dentist will be an expert, but an epidemiologist will not be an expert. Okay, because there is no feedback. Let's, let's skin it again. And this is very simple Darwinian um, survival. Simple. I mean, it's not too complicated that it's Darwinian survival because it's very simple. You have a selection process that, that you know, you survive, right? Like in nature, you have fitness. So you have all these people who reject the idea of intelligent design which they interpret, say, in a naive way, first order way, not as a metaphor. But, it, but they want to be like academics, they want you know, no contact with reality. They want just rationalism to make things work. It doesn't work that way. I mean, you cannot believe in God when it comes to academia, but disbelieve in God outside. You have to be consistent, okay? So, and this, of course, you remember this cartoon, which violates my idea of, of the pseudo-expert, because they, Say these smart pilots have lost touch with regulate, uh, regular passengers like us. Who thinks I should fly the plane? So the point is, what we're observing is not a riot against experts. It's a riot against a certain class of experts. I call those the IYI, intellectually yet idiot, because of lack of contact with reality. Anything like academia doesn't have contact with reality <coughs> collapses. Academics, are you judged by other, by peers, uh, Pasquale? Who judges you? You're an academic. We're both in the same, you know, we're now in the same department. Who judges you? Your peers? Other academics? Well, there's an expert problem, <laughs> okay? So if you're not judged by PNL, we say, or reality or something like that. And this, yeah, so the pilot definitely has to be an expert, and there's a very simple reason. What happens to pilots who were pseudo-experts? There we go. There we go. They, 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 they died, and, and their passengers died. So basically, we have Darwinian, it's called Darwinian, you know, it's called at least survival of the fittest, or survival of the, of the non-experts, uh, non okay? 
And then, of course, you end up having fields such as this is the mind of an economist. <laughs> well, that's a clarity of mind on a good day of an economist. Why? Because there's no contact with reality. You don't have to be consistent. So you can have the Nobel Prize given, in, uh, pseudo, uh, the pseudo Nobel in economics, given to two people saying opposite things. You can't say, I mean, you, you can't do that in physics. You say, you, know, you throw the ball, it goes up, and then you go, down. Oh, let's be hedged, let's give the Nobel to both. Because the problem is, you end up with a mind like this if you judge by, by your peers, not by experts, okay? So, now the concept of symmetry. So let me, uh, uh, let me do the following. Before I get into Hammurabi, let me describe Wall Street. Hopefully this will have a pointer. No, no pointer, okay? So the, there's something I call the Bob Rubin trade, the absence of symmetry. And again, skin in the game is about certain classes of asymmetry, and we're gonna see the, what, what the name comes from and the link to the pseudo-expert. The fellow was chairman of the, now it would be called chairperson, of uh, Citibank or Citicorp. Spent 10 years there, and he received $120 million in compensation. Okay? And when the crisis happened 10 years ago, I don't know if you were, many of you were born, you know, many of you at least were, 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 were uh, you know, conscious of what was going on. So 10 years ago, the, the, there was a crisis. So, and then he said some, that the very unfortunate, highly unexpected event, often called Black Swan, for which we apologize profusely, but we are excused as nobody could predict these things happened, okay? No, very nice. He acknowledged that it was, it was uh, a black swan named after a very, very stubborn author. Okay. Okay. But, but sometimes pleasant if you have coffee with him, you know, not, not necessarily. But stubborn, definitely uh, uh, intellectually. All right. So but, but what's the problem there? Let's think about it. He ma you make the upside when you're right. And when you're wrong, who pays for the losses? Sorry? We, we, you, the, the, the Spanish grammar instructors, a recurring person in the book who pays for losses made by others, uh, yoga instructors, uh, Google uh, sushi chefs, right? Okay, no, and, and, and so on. Okay, they paid the price, in, directly or indirectly. So, what we have here is a violation of a law that effectively is the first law extant, Hammurabi's rule. And it says the following. If you, if the architect builds a building and the building collapses and kills the owner of the building, what should happen to the architect? He should be put to death. I mean, it was Babylon 3,800 years ago, so they were not, you know, didn't have a very sophisticated legal code, all right? And so, and then of course, if it kills, uh, the firstborn, the firstborn son of the architect is put to death. So they're really, they're looking for symmetry. Now, what was the idea of Hammurabi's code? It was not eye for eye. <laughs> eye for eye limiting damages, you know, and making things balanced, no. It was that you cannot walk away from risks you've created for others. You should own your risks. That's the idea of Hammurabi's code. You cannot have civilized society unless those who create risks aren't also bearers of that risk. So when you get on a highway, you know, on uh, Hudson, you know, you can, you know, get drunk to whatever something that people do when they want to have fun or want to become reckless drivers and become a reckless driver. And, go, and the best way, if you want to kill a lot of people, is you go against traffic, okay? 150 miles an hour against traffic. Why is it that we don't see, we don't hear about these people? It's a highly symmetrical punishment. They're already dead. <laughs> okay. you, you, visibly, you know, if you have these traits, you're gonna, you're more exposed, you're, you're exposed, or even more exposed than, than regular people. So, at all times in history, we've had that symmetry prevailing. 
we can look at it operation symmetry, but let's first look at it from a moral standpoint, okay? You've heard of the golden rule, do unto others what you want them to do to you, which I, in fact, I find a little intrusive because say I like raw Lebanese meat, Lebanese kibbe, I'm not gonna force you to eat it, all right? So there's actually, and, and say I'm a bureaucrat and, and like this kind of stuff, I'm not gonna force you. There's a much more robust silver rule. Don't do to others what you don't, don't want them to do to you. And, and, and effectively you can't have civilization without the silver rule. <coughs> because, and also, and unfortunately people don't understand it, it extends to international affairs, the silver rule. How? Treat other countries the way you'd like other countries to treat you if you were weaker, okay? And there's a fractal aspect of the silver rule. Counties should treat other counties the same, you know, and so on, that kind of symmetry. That's a moral symmetry. And of course, it kept going, that, that rule kept going and evolving, sometimes in the wrong direction, Kantian. Uh, I talk a lot about Kantian universalism, it's not practical, because the universal kills a particular, and it's not fractal, okay? It becomes anonymous, uh, you have to layer it, and, and, and if we have time, you know, we can say why. But anyway, so this is, the golden rule came across ethical systems, religion, and the last, last iteration is, um, is, uh, <coughs> is with the uh, with Kant but but basically the most the most robust is a silver rule you, you want as a business and anything to treat others that, like the way you don't want to harm them okay you want to treat them not treat them the way they wouldn't like them to treat you okay it's called a negative golden rule and, and of course it has a lot of you know you, we can talk in the small and the large this is called hidden asymmetries in daily life, okay? And, and something quite obvious, as obvious as the cook should eat his or her cooking, okay? It needs to apply everywhere, and these rules were, um, did prevail until recently. And we're gonna see why or where they stopped prevailing. But they prevailed for a long time until, say, maybe a generation and a half ago, or two generations ago. So, the, uh, and, and it was quite sophisticated how merchants should treat other merchants, okay? How you should have stiffer ethical rules, more equity within a group, in-group than out-group, but still have the same out-group. Actually, it's much more workable within communities, outside communities. And now one thing about skin in the game, skin in the game is interested in two aspects of social thought that are not discussed. The first one is dynamics, in other words, things happen over time, how systems, what, what rules should be applied over time. You don't take a snapshot and we'll see how, why, uh, and uh, the mistake. And the second one is scaling, that things change in scale. A small hamlet will not become, cannot, you cannot turn the dynamics of a hamlet into a small village. <laughs> and a small village cannot become is not, you know, cannot turn into a, uh, a very, very small town, okay? You have scale, some kind of scale uh, transformation that happen when, when groups become larger, and that's mathematical, okay? And at many levels, for example, I can predict how each and every one of you behave, assuming I could do that, but as a group, I can't predict the behavior as a group because a group is a different animal. Likewise, we know that if people are, have all these uh, ethical traits individually, when you put them together in groups of 250, they will be very ethical in preserving the commons, like fishermen not overfishing, because you, you're harming future generation. But when the group becomes 200,000, <laughs> it doesn't work, see? So that's one aspect of scalability that has a political implication. You, and, and, and books. So it's very, very compatible to be a communist in your village and libertarian at the federal level <laughs> and Democrats for the county while being a Republican for the state. Okay, it's perfectly compatible. You cannot have a political opinion without attaching a scale to it. So communism can work in Singapore, <laughs> okay, because it's small, much better than China. Look at the success. 
okay, or so that form of socialism. Or you can, if you, you cannot, you, you, can, you should separate the political label from the scale, okay. So, and likewise in commerce, okay, if you don't have in groups and out groups and different layers, things don't work. Because if you don't have individual and then the rest of the world, you have layers. You have the individual, the family, or whatever is defined as his fa or her family, the tribe, whatever he or she defined as tribe, and then you go up the layers. And, and that works a lot better because the tribes deal with one another. The dynamics of, of, of tribes dealing with one another need to mirror the same symmetry. And it looks like, I mean, the ancients were conscious of it. They understood scaling. They understood that you can love your town when it's a small town, but it's not the same love when it's a large town. Okay, the ancients, you knew that. So this is the idea of scaling, particularly when the scale of the game changes. Now, risk as virtue of the, I don't know how many Roman emperors we've had, close to 300. How many died in, of natural uh, death? Assuming those really died of natural death. I mean, we don't have auto modern autopsies. How many? Half, three quarters, 100%? Uh, no more than a third, all right? And we're not sure about that third. And of course, had they lived longer, had they not died of pneumonia or something, all right, they would have <laughs> been killed by someone, all right? And then this is a picture of Valerian, the Roman emperor who was captured by the Persians and used as a footstool. So these are the risks you get for being a Roman emperor, okay? It's risky to be a Roman emperor. Julian, who's my hero in a book, Julian the, uh, the, the emperor, who's uh, known as the apostate, okay, he died at a Persian uh, border with a spear in his chest, okay? He, he didn't even have an armor. <laughs> now, this contrasts heavily with warmongers today warmongers who are sitting in an air-conditioned office in Washington. Can we name names on Google uh, thing? And they can sue me directly, okay? In the name, in the book, I name names. Like uh, um, Thomas Friedman and all these neocons, they can cause wars in Iraq, devastations, hundreds of thousands of people killed, maybe more, financial uh, you know, trauma. What price did they pay? Zero. So let's merge the ethics and epistemology. If they had to pay for their mistakes, like the driver who disappears, the system don't learn because people learn. Systems don't learn. Systems learn if you have the survival mechanism by eliminating those who don't have that trait. So you, you systems uh, in biology, systems learn at a cellular level. It's not like your your knowledge that changes. So. So, of course, you're going to have a lot of warmongers today. This is a danger for humanity. Now that, and they're going to use any excuse to, 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 warm, to become warmongers, okay? And then even we'll get leftist ideas, okay? Because uh, the, the armed merchants know how to play the system and can say, oh, we're, we're humanitarian war. Humanitarian war, like in Libya, change of regime, all right? Oh, yeah, but look, we have democracy, right? You kill everyone and say, well, look, their cholesterol level <laughs> improved, all right? So, <laughs> The, uh, that we've used those metrics. So the point is, that, they, uh, that has, this is very recent. Hannibal first in battle. Napoleon had to be more exposed than other soldiers. And the English feudal system, the lord, you're a lord because you're a lord, because you're, uh, you're, you take risk for others. You trade risk for social status. Very few societies had people of rank make decisions without being themselves exposed to, to the harm from these decisions at all levels, economic, financial, everything, physical. Now comes the notion of risk as virtue. We're not stupid. We have some organic understanding of these things. And the peacock, you know the, the Havian peacock uh, story? The, the peacock, why did the, the peacock has a big tail? Absolutely useless. It's precisely because it's useless. And the peacock can maintain such a tail. It, 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 it shows some kind of, um, uh, of um, uh, some kind of biological fitness, okay, 
to be able to carry such a tail. Now the peacock, the Havian peacock, is a nice, you know, framework, what we call the Zahavian trait, a superfluous trait, but that gives you definitely um, some kind of fitness. People who have scars, people who have scars, command respect. People who, have, who take risks, command respects. People don't realize it, but that's what's happening, <laughs> okay? Which is it was, it was a very bad idea for political parties to propose candidates who are lifetime bureaucrats. You see, and people detect it. Like in Switzerland, they try to pass a law to limit the income for chief executives, but nobody thought of limiting the income of entrepreneurs. Why an entrepreneur takes risks? Chief executive is someone who works through the system and making 75 times what an employee makes. True, the law didn't pass, but that's uh, the idea behind it. So, the, um, and this explains Christology. Think about it. Why is it that we have the Trinity, which absolutely makes no sense to anyone outside the Christian religion? Why is it that we had to keep going back to the Trinity? Fights, arguments, debate, debates in Greek that nobody could understand because it's translated into Latin be the same word. They kept going back that the Christ cannot be God. But think about it. If this person had a parachute, if an acrobat had walked in with a parachute, would you pay for, for that? It'd be like a video game, right? So the whole thing is you signal by risk taking. And the idea of Christology is, is, is it really puts skin in the game in, uh, uh, in a deity, right? So he's not God because he had to suffer. If he didn't suffer, it would be like a uh, tomato, you know, for an actor in a movie. It's not tomato sauce. It's not, that doesn't work that way, you see? So that's the idea of signaling via risk taking that you are, in fact, uh, uh, exhibiting virtue via risk. And again, now comes virtue. Every time I get into a hotel room, I get into, a, I don't know if you've seen me angry on Twitter. I'm like that in person when I'm angry, you know, I, okay. What sets me off is going in, save our planet, dear, let's say a million. What is, I mean, is this virtuous? I think it makes, it would make much more sense if they told us, listen, um, you know, it's good for us. If you, saved, if, you, if you saved on towels, it's good for us, bottom line, okay? So it's like, don't invoke the planet because as a, uh, you see. So this is cheap, cheap virtue signaling is, is actually in a self-serving way is what we're getting into. True virtue is risk-taking. Socrates is what we try to impart to the Christ. He really suffers. He can't be God. You know, he had to be human to suffer. Socrates, standing up for your ideas. Journalism, when you know, when you have an oppressive regime like in uh, in um, Argentina or in uh, in in, uh, in Latin America, you you know, during these dark periods, that is risk taking. And effectively, the only way I can claim that I can say that an entrep that, that a, um, a public intellectual is not a BS vendor is he or she takes risk with every statement. So people ask me, why am I insulting people directly in my books? Risk taking, I want them to sue me. <laughs> That's simple, it's not like I have nothing, I've never met Thomas Friedman. <laughs> Actually I did once, crossed, I had already insulted him uh, in, in Davos and, and it was an eye contact that was okay. But I never met uh, many of the people, I, uh, Robert Rubin had never met him, okay? But I want to take risks, this is, this is the idea. <laughs> I'm signaling. Why do I curse on Twitter? Not in my books because I don't like the aesthetics of a curse. Because it's risk taking, <laughs> you see? So that's simple. Now let's continue. People ask me, uh, uh, what should I be doing? Okay, I'm 20 and uh, you know, go somewhere. Start a business, take risks now. Because everybody wants to work for a GMO to improve the world and you end up like the UN offices, manufacturing problems, 
to so we hire more staff, we'll fly business class and have an apartment in Geneva, that kind of stuff. Start a business because we're tired of people who want to work for NGOs, <laughs> okay? Start a business, create jobs for others, okay? And do not rent seek. Do not be in rent seeking. Have some skin in the game. Just like, you know, your, your uh, grandparents probably, your grand, one of your grandfathers was at age 18 disembarking in Normandy. They took a lot of risk, these kids, 18 year old. Okay, take some risk starting business. Now, finally, when it comes to inequality, there's something about inequality that's mismeasured. And I said we have to use dynamics, not statics. People tolerate inequality if the person at the top got there via risk taking, not rent seeking. And more significantly, if he or she has a chance to collapse, <laughs> you see? The, comp the, 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 the bad news for Google, I mean, Google is definitely a lot of good news for humanity and bad news for Google. When I was an MBA student, I'm very, very old, as you can see, I had hair then. The company spent about 50, 60 years in the S&P 500. So it was stable at the top. How stable is it today? Less than? 30 years. Keep going. Less than 30, keep going. Ten years. Sorry? 10 years. Ten years. Is that so? 10 to 12 years. I think maybe even it's dropping, all right? It's just, dro it's just dropping, but I don't think it dropped that low yet. You, you can't measure because it's standard error in measurement, okay? We have a big uh, statistical expert here, my co author, who will tell you <laughs> that, but we know there's definitely uh, much lower, yes, and, yes. and you can't take fluctuation, but it basically tells you that the way from dorms to Google can only be short. I mean, these guys were in dorms, no? To Google can only be short if the road from Google to dorms is equally <laughs> so, okay? You, have, you need short route from the top, okay? And effectively, you have a short route from the top. It doesn't take long, Sears, okay? So, so we have, in, so I don't mind inequality, because this is mismeasured, and actually the, the, even the inequality, people say, oh, look at Europe, they have less inequality. What do you mean less inequality? Sorry, I cursed, you can clip. <laughs> so they have, they have in Europe, if you take, uh, um, if, if you, okay, let's take in the US, 1982 versus 2012, Forbes 500 billionaires, or, or rich people, the richest, 10% of the families across the list. In Europe, someone did Florence 1580. <laughs> the families are today, as today. And in, yeah, and in France, uh, I have two more minutes for the lecture. And in France, if you, uh, if you study, say, the equivalent of Harvard or something like that, then you're, you're done, okay? You're gonna run a big corporations. And they have a low bankruptcy rate. So you need a high bankruptcy rate in a system don't shoot for equality, shoot for a high bankruptcy rate. <laughs> so people have the, the, also the illusion that you want opportunity means people to be able to go up. No, you want people to come down, <laughs> okay, from the top. This is what you gotta focus on in society. This is an approach, a dynamic approach. We spoke about scaling, this is a dynamic approach to social problems. Now, epistemology experience. To explain, I'm gonna explain a couple of uh, weird things we have in a minute. There's a story in uh, both anti-fragile and skin in the game of a fellow who lost a million dollars trading green lumber. He knew everything about uh, lumber, green lumber, and everything. The economics, the mathematics, the statistics, collected data, everything. And lost a million dollars and wrote an account what I learned losing a million dollars. And he reports that there's a fellow, a pit trader, you know, it's like, I don't know if you met pit traders, but they, they look like pit traders, and they act like pit traders, right? <laughs> and these, the, the, the fellow was making tons of money with green lumber and had been doing so consistently. Now, the narrator discovers <laughs> that the fellow made a lot of money in green lumber, didn't know, he thought it was lumber painted green. He didn't know it was freshly cut lumber, <laughs> okay? So, is it that that person this is a very high an argument. No, knew nothing about the No. That he knew a lot of stuff, but not necessarily what you think from the outside is valuable. 
So that when you have skin in the game, you tend to know a lot of stuff about the business, about things, all right, that you wouldn't guess you'd need to know from the outside. And this is very hard to explain. And this is why machine learning is successful, because machine learning has no ideas. <laughs> Doesn't learn, it learns from the inside, not from the outside. And then finally, we have one minute. Um, when you have in a business where there's skin in a game, say surgery, you go to a hospital and because to install the, you want a brain surgeon to install the next Google product, you know, <laughs> which helps you solve you know, differential equations, you install it, you put it in your brain. It's a very delicate operation. Many people have died, you know, all right, uh, on a, a during, so it's a very dangerous operation, okay? There's a choice between two doctors. One doctor who looks like the Hollywood version of a doctor, of a surgeon, well-mannered, well-educated, and then the other person looks like a butcher. And these two had the same track record, had the same rank at the hospital, okay? Which doctor would you pick? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Sorry? The one, because this person had to overcome, because not, it's not judged at all by anything external, nothing, nothing peer reviewed, judged entirely by the track record, you see, by the performance. You have to overcome all this perception bias to get there. So this is it. When a field that has skin in the game, the cosmetic, beware of the cosmetic. Likewise, you want to fund people? If they know how to write business plans, no, <laughs> okay? If they make money at something and you don't understand how, hire them, right? <laughs> it's a green lumber problem. So I'm gonna stop here because, you know, we can keep going forever. And uh, to, for the Q&A, so thank you for listening to me. And, uh, and I'm honored to be again here at Google six years later, and hopefully in six years you'll still be around. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
it's a white supremacist type thing. Well, whatever, the, the, everything they do is backwards, okay? The, the, but then there is a real left. So there's a book that came to that effect called uh, by, um, in France in the 1900s, early 1900s, and it's called The Betrayal of the Clerks by Julien Benda, who, who really said the same thing. And I realized that for a long time, people kept citing Benda about what they call faux unsincere intellectual. Four intellectual. And sincere intellectual for me, like I have, I, I say, I name Susan Sontag. Susan Sontag, as an insincere intellectual, had one day, I was the first time I ever, you know, was ever interviewed in my life, you know, full by randoms was out. I was in a radio station at the BBC in the office in New York, and she got developed an interest. This book writes on randomness. Oh, very interesting. Ah, oh, you're in the markets. I hate the, the markets, it's explosive, whatever. It's just, well, on, on, and on, on, and on. Okay, so I tried to explain to her it's not rent-seeking, but, but she treated me like I was, I was crap. And, and she left as I was mid-sentence, as I was mid-sentence, just to humiliate me, okay? So I said, okay, so she probably lives in upstate New York, in Woodstock, and farms her own vegetables, and she wants to live outside the market system. And then her obituary came. She lived in a $17 million mansion. <laughs> Not here, around here in Chelsea. So you realize, you know, that's the absence of skin in the game. If you, it's fine to be against the market system, but please live in a commune somewhere on a kibbutz in upstate New York, <laughs> eating uh, radishes and stuff, and that's fine. I have respect for that, okay? But I don't have respect for the caviar type, you know? And then you extend the caviar intellectual to lot, many, many, um, many uh, things, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Um, I really like this idea of skin in the game. Uh, I think we should all uh, adhere to that. Um, and so an, as an example of that, you mentioned the, uh, the save, save the planet, save the earth with the towels thing. Yeah. So indeed, that could have been put there for one of two reasons, as I see it. It could be that they had nefarious reasons for doing so. They, wanted to, they actually knew that it didn't work like that, but they put it there anyway because it might help their bottom line appeal to uh, hotel guests and so on. But it could, of course, also be because out of ignorance, right? It could be that they didn't know. Many people don't know the details of this. Uh, and as another example of that, the peacock, OK? And I, I say this as an evolutionary biologist. Um, the peacock's tail is not useless. I just want to say this once and for all, because people yeah. always bring up this right, damned okay. example. The peacock's tail is not useless. If you see a peacock in a zoo and a little child runs over or a dog runs over, they might lift their uh, tail. It's not a tail, but they might lift those feathers, and that scares off everyone from dogs to children. That's the purpose of that. Okay? Just wanted to point okay, out. Okay. So, so, yeah. But, but uh, let, let's say the peacock tail is useless, but there exists something called the Havian signaling. Which is a mistake. There is, there is, there is lots of signaling that that is cost of signaling, exactly, yeah, and, cost and sexual selection indeed. Also, in this case of the peacock, does have a, a large effect, but it is not a useless thing. It is not something that only okay, inhibits right. it. It actually scares away predators. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm curious about how you synthesize um, ideas. Like, uh, are, are there any personal habits that you could share? I don't know. Like, how do you decide, say? Um, what to read to broaden your horizons, Basically, especially when there is so much rule. noise out there. There is a simple rule. If something bores you, close the book. That's it. Go to something else. It's not that if, if, if you have to also say, if you want to read a lot of stuff, it's not that you need to stop reading because you're bored. You're bored with that specific author. And then little by little, you figure out how people get bored with books. I mean, most books are boring, and most books don't survive. And you can tell that books that are boring don't survive. I mean, the people may buy them for a while just to show off with them. But so, if something bores you, skip it. Don't, don't do anything boring. And you know, after a while, you develop a technique to read a lot of stuff. Uh, if I can ask yeah. a quick so, follow-up, the, 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 because there, there are oh, more sure. people. Yeah, but uh, go ahead. If you have a group of experts or pseudo experts uh, that has no skin in the game, do you have a rule of thumb on how long they can last before it collapses? Definitely, this is a very excellent question because no system. As I was saying, those people, for example, trying in universities now to create all these, uh, uh, recreate uh, classifications that, that didn't exist before, OK? Uh, can it survive? No, because uh, you, you cannot, uh, the, the, you, sometimes you read something that's completely BS, that it takes a lot more energy to displace BS than truth. It's the opposite. Truth is, is the basin of attraction, has been over history. 
So eventually things will revert to the truth. From what, there's also a mechanism, I call the minority rule, that makes things revert to the truth. But, but I, I, in history, unless the truth is not helpful for survival, <laughs> you see, the, 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 it will, it will, you know, unless it's really not helpful, it's guaranteed to prevail eventually. Yes. Um, that's a sort of follow-up on uh, the question which was just asked, but you know, uh, you don't, you're not a fan of academia because you know of uh, all the problems it has. But uh, if you apply the Lindy effect, like look at Harvard, right? It has uh, 300 yeah, years or Harvard so. today, okay. So I, I'm shortening to, to explain. Say Harvard today, has, Lindy has survived so long. Uh, the, several things. Number one, Harvard today is not the way Harvard was in the past. And the purpose of going to Harvard in the past was not the same purpose of going to Harvard today. People had the illusion that universities started as a place for people to go read interesting books and then go home. All right, that was a university. It was, you know, the, the free people's the liberal arts, the free people's arts. So it was like organized not as a professional thing, you know, like medical school, like accounting school, like uh, vocational school, but organized as a place for people to seek knowledge. There was maybe some in the ideology, but not much, <laughs> okay? And then, uh, but look at the universities today. The universities today, I mean, Google now no, no longer hires from universities, right? So the, uh, and in the past, most people didn't go to university. People went and studied a craft or a trade, typically via, that's Lindy, via a, uh, the apprenticeship mechanism. And this is the apprenticeship mechanism, <laughs> okay? And still in Germany today, half the people go through some kind of apprenticeship. So the, the, we have enough money to maintain prestige goods like Harvard, okay, and Vuitton bags, but, but it's not, you know, the, 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 the society doesn't, doesn't uh, need uh, these universities. And they themselves are pricing themselves out of the market because of they turning into selling ideology rather than selling, and that's theory. For example, to give you an idea, I've, I've run into French professors of French literature who spoke broken French because they speak and then they have prestigious position because they write on some post-colonial aspect of the identity of this, of this, and in, in that French, uh, in Maupassant. And that's how, that, that's how they judge one another. You see, two more minutes, okay. Two more questions, okay. Uh, so this is why we've got to mutate to the apprenticeship model. Back, yes, go ahead. Sure. I, I, heard, I heard you um, criticize the Iraq um, war as well as the Libya intervention. So I'm curious to find out from you when intervention is justified and your position on the non-interference. Okay, um, if you own it, Rwanda, very simple, to, to Rwanda, shorten, yeah. it is justified if those who advocate for it are willing to pay the price if they're wrong. Okay, if you, 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 want, you want to settle... Uh, 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 you want to settle in Iraq in case the thing goes wrong? Be my guest. Go ahead, and we're going to listen to your opinion. But you got a price to pay if things go wrong. You want to settle in Libya? Go, ha go ahead. Today, Libya has a slave market. Okay? Don't tell me uh, you know, that, 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 that your, uh, your thing was, was harmless. It's called the iatrogenics. People should always pay for the iatrogenics. What's the price, though? Like, what? Some kind of price. Uh, for now, it's zero price. <laughs> y yes. Uh, you, that's the last question, I guess, because, uh, yes, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah. If you read things like the Federalist Papers, the framers go out of their way to talk about sort of decentralizing power and how important that is, and that's, yes. like, a big reason why the U.S. is still around. Do we need something similar for corporations as well because they have a tendency to really centralize their power, or do we okay. just need to leave it to markets to kill companies? Corporations, uh, no, it's best for corporations uh, to die and be replaced. I mean, you're not going to die if your corporation dies. Okay, or it mutates into a different group or spin-offs and stuff like that. But if I, you, you know, visibly, if I want to come, if you want to come back to this world, come back as a decentralized system of cockroaches rather than elephants, your, your survival as a species is going to be longer, you see. So the corporations, basically the minute the co company joins the S&P 500, it looks like uh, the... the you know, like started commit the suicide process, okay? And, and, and of course, a uh, company that, that don't join the S&P 500 have a, a huge survival advantage. What it shows from the data, family businesses, stuff like that. So it looks like when you join the market, become large enough to have investors, 
your policy is going to be driven by the the 28 year old uh, journalist major who joined the New York, the, at the um, at the Wall Street Journal who's going to comment on you, right? And and collapse Steve Jobs and bully him, for example, <laughs> that has happened. Okay, so so this was going to happen. Or the analyst, the MBA from Wharton, some of my classmates became analysts at, at Goldman Sachs and then collapse uh, uh, the chairperson of a company and, and bully him or her. Okay, so so this is the, the the so the stock market accelerates the process, and then we have no evidence. We've seen no evidence of economies of scale for being large. As a matter of fact, there, there are economies of scale that are discussed in anti-fragile. Thanks for inviting me. Bye.